Here we're gonna look at a nice problem from the 2016 Brazilian undergraduate math Olympiad. And I think one of the big advantages of an undergraduate math Olympiad versus a high school math Olympiad is the ability to draw on a larger number of courses. And as we'll see, this one involves quite a bit of linear algebra. So we wanna consider a two by two matrix, which we will call A, and it's given by four minus root five, two root five minus three. And our goal is to find all integers M and N satisfying three rules. So N is bigger than or equal to one. The absolute value of M is less than or equal to N. And finally, the most important is that the nth power of the matrix A minus M plus N squared times A is in M two by two Z. And what I mean by that is that this object only has integer entries, which is kind of surprising given up here it has irrational entries. Okay, great. So let's get to it. We want to zero in on this fact right here that we need the nth power of A and think about how do you find an arbitrary power of a matrix. And you can do that by diagonalizing that matrix if it is diagonalizable. But this one we will see is diagonalizable. So how do you diagonalize a matrix? Well, you first need to find the eigenvalues and then the eigenvectors, and then you can proceed algorithmically. So let's maybe go ahead and do that. We need to find the eigenvalues of A, and we do that by looking at the characteristic polynomial of A. So I'll call that piece of A of X. That's defined to be the determinant of A minus X times the identity matrix. So that's gonna be the determinant, which now I will denote by these like, just kind of large absolute value type symbols around the matrix. And now we'll have four minus X here. We'll have minus root five here. We'll have two root five here. And then finally we'll have minus three minus X here. Then using the standard formula for a two by two determinant, so we have this A times D minus B times C formula, we can easily calculate this characteristic polynomial. So we'll have four minus X times minus three minus X minus two root five times negative root five. So I've left all the structure in there so we can see exactly what's going on. Now I can take this minus sign and this minus sign and cancel them both to pluses. And then I can also maybe take the minus sign out of this and have it switch the order of subtraction here. So that'll turn this into X minus four times X plus three. So obviously this stuff is not required for getting the calculation right, but it does help maybe decrease the possibility of making small mistakes. Okay, now we can FOIL this thing out. That will give us x squared minus 4x plus 3x, so that's gonna be minus x, and then minus 12. And now we'll have plus two times root five times root five, so that'll be plus 10. Great, but now we can obviously simplify that. That's gonna be x squared minus x minus two. Now we can factor that out easily, and we'll see that this is equal to x minus two times x plus one. So that tells us that we have two distinct eigenvalues and maybe we'll call those lambda one and we'll say lambda one is equal to minus one and then lambda two and that'll be equal to two. So obviously the lambda one comes from this root right here and the lambda two comes from the portion of this polynomial right here. Now we need to find the eigenvectors. So let's move towards finding that. So in order to find the eigenvectors, you need to look at a certain null space. So we need to investigate the null space of A minus lambda one times the identity. So this would be for the eigenvector associated to eigenvalue minus one or eigenvalue lambda one. So that's gonna be equal to the null space of A plus the identity given in this case that our eigenvalue is minus one. Okay, so that's gonna be equal to the null space of, well, it's pretty easy to add the identity to any matrix. We'll have a five here, that'll change this to a two here. So we'll have five minus root five, two root five, and then minus two. 
like that. Now, next up, we want to row reduce that thing. Well, let's maybe recall what it means to be in the null space. So any eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda one will be in the null space of this. So let's suppose that V1, which we'll call X comma Y, is in the null space of this matrix, which is five minus root five, two root five, and then minus two. Okay, well, what that tells us is that five minus root five, two root five minus two times our vector V1, which is given by X, Y, will be equal to the zero vector zero, zero. Or that's associated to the following augmented matrix. So now we have five minus root five, two root five, and then minus two augmented with zero, zero. Now we can start row reducing this. And after row reducing this, we can pull out the solution, well, the vector that's in the null space, AKA the eigenvector pretty easily. Okay, so maybe what would we like to do in order to simplify this? Well, maybe we can multiply the second row by the square root of five, and then multiply the first row by two. That'll give us some nice simplification. So I will write that like this. So we'll do row one becomes two row one. And then we'll say row two is exchanged with the square root of five row two. So let's see what that gives us. So that'll give us the matrix 10 minus two root five, and then another 10 minus two root five, zero, zero for our augmented part. But notice that row one and row two are the same. So that means we can maybe do row two minus row one becomes our new row two. And that'll give us the matrix 10 minus two root five, zero, zero, augmented with zero, zero. And then from there, we can calculate the eigenvector pretty easily, but we're running out of room, so I'll clean this up and then we'll do that. So in the last board, we said if we had an eigenvalue of negative one and the corresponding eigenvector was V1, then V1 was in the null space of this matrix, which has been row reduced. So it's 10 minus two root five, zero, zero. So that means if you left multiply by that matrix to our vector X, Y, we get zero, zero. But that gives us a nice equation that relates X and Y. Notice now we'll have 10 X minus two times the square root of five, Y equals zero. But that tells us that the square root of five, Y equals 5x, just after moving some things around. But now we can divide both sides by the square root of five to put y in terms of x, and we'll see that y is equal to the square root of five times x. Next, we see that we could take x to be equal to one because x is a free variable here. There's a whole infinite family of vectors in this eigenspace or this null space, depending on how you're thinking about it. So we might as well set x equal to one. That means y will be equal to the square root of five, which tells us that our eigenvector v1 associated with eigenvalue lambda one, which is minus one, can be taken to be one and then square root of five. Now I'll go ahead and skip the calculation for v2 because it's essentially the same thing and it just kind of takes a long time. But if we take lambda two to be equal to two, that's our second eigenvalue, we can easily check that V two, our second eigenvector, can be given by the square root of five, two, like that. So now let's summarize this at the top of the board and we'll move on. So on the last board, we determined that A has eigenvectors and eigenvalues given by minus one V1, where V1 is that vector right there, and then two V2, where that's the vector over there. Next, we can set our matrix P, which is our diagonalizing matrix, equal to the, vec the matrix made up of these eigenvectors. So this will be one root five in the first column and then root five, two in the second column. And then by some linear algebra facts, we know that P inverse AP will be the diagonal matrix where the diagonal entries correspond to the eigenvalues that correspond to these eigenvectors. So we're here we'll have minus one, zero, zero, two, like that. Okay, great. 
But notice that that allows us to write A in terms of this diagonal matrix. In fact, we'll have A equal to P times this diagonal matrix minus 1, 0, 0, 2 times P inverse. Also, we can calculate P inverse really quickly just using the standard formula for the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. So let's do that maybe down here. We have P inverse is equal to, well, it's going to be 1 over the determinant. So let's see what the determinant is. It'll be 2 minus 5, so that'll be 1 over 3, but it'll be negative. And then you switch the diagonals, so 2 and 1, and you negate the off diagonal. So we'll have minus root 5, minus root 5. So that's the standard formula for the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. Okay, next up, we can use the fact that this diagonalization procedure is a really good trick for finding an arbitrary power of this matrix. So now we can write a to the n power as p times minus 1 to the n, 0, 0, 2 to the n times p inverse, like that. But that tells us that a to the n will be equal to, well, we can write p here. This is going to be 1 root 5 root 5 2 and then minus 1 to the n, 0, 0, 2 to the n. And then finally, this matrix here, so I can just bring that third in. So we've got minus 2 thirds, minus root 5 over 3, but the minus signs cancel. And then another root 5 over 3 here, and then minus 1 third. So we need to take the product of these three matrices, and that'll give us this arbitrary power of A. So let's maybe see what that is real quick. So maybe I'll bring that down here. First, we will multiply these two parts. And after multiplying those two parts, we'll see that we have, well, doing this, we'll have minus one to the n in this entry. Here we'll have two to the n times root five. Here we'll have minus one to the n times root five. And then finally here, we'll have two to the n plus one. So that's kind of nice. So now we have to take that matrix and multiply it to this minus 2 thirds root 5 over 3 root 5 over 3 and then minus 1 third. So again we just have to brush up on our matrix multiplication rules. So let's see what we get. I'll maybe just do one or two of the entries and I'll let you guys check the rest. So let's take this row multiply it to this column and then add. So notice that's gonna give us minus one to the n plus one times two thirds. So that's this entry times this entry. And then we'll have two to the n times root five times root five over three. So that's gonna be two to the n times five over three. Two to the n times five over three. So that's the top left entry. Then I'll let you guys calculate this entry, this entry, and this entry on your own. And what we'll do on the next board is jump to the point where we have this object right here, which I've under braced, just all expanded out. On the last board, we set up a bunch of calculation, and I did a lot of it off screen. And I found out that our object that we're interested in being a matrix with only integer entries has this form. So notice the diagonal entries are rational, but the off diagonal entries are multiples of the square root of five. But the fact that they're multiples of the square root of five tells us that these coefficients have to be zero in order to be in this M2Z. So let's maybe go ahead and point that out. So we want this thing here to be equal to zero and we want this thing here to be equal to zero. But if you look at this, these two are multiples of each other. Notice if you multiply this guy right here by minus two, you get this guy right here. So actually we only have one equation here. So let's maybe go ahead and investigate this equation. So like I said, we need to look at minus one to the n plus one times two thirds plus 
two to the n plus one over three minus two times n plus n squared, and we want that to be equal to zero. So this is actually gonna split off into two cases. One case when n is even, and one case when n is odd. And that's because we'll have different powers here for the negative one. But let's maybe see if we can keep those around as long as possible. First off, I wanna notice that I can easily solve this thing for m. So let's maybe solve that for m and see what we get. So if we distribute this minus two times m through, we'll have this turns into minus two m minus two n squared like that. Then we can easily move the minus two m to the other side of the equation, giving us two m equals, so this is gonna be minus two n squared from that term right here, and then plus minus one to the n plus one times two thirds, and then plus two to the n plus one over three, like that. So notice we can simplify this pretty easily, just divide both sides by two, and we get m in terms of n. So we have m equals, so I'm gonna maybe reorder this thing a little bit. Maybe we'll write it as two to the n over three. We'll put that term first. And then next we'll have minus, minus one to the n times two thirds. And then finally minus n squared. And I just realized that should be one third because I divided by two. Okay, so now we have that happening. So now let's break this into an even case and an odd case. So if n is even, that's going to give us m equals two to the n over three minus one third minus n squared. So that's because minus one to the n is one in that case. And if n is odd, what we'll get is m equals two to the n over three plus one third minus n squared like that. So now let's maybe bring those two cases to the top and we'll finish it off. Now we're ready to finish this off and I'm actually gonna leave like a little bit of homework problem because this turns out to be really long if you look at all of the details. So as we saw on the last board, we've got a value for m in terms of n in the case when n is even and odd and they're pretty similar but slightly different. And notice that I've got this two to the n term and this minus three n squared term but this two to the n term is gonna grow much more quickly than this three, to the, three times n squared term. That means at some point, m will definitely be bigger than n, and you just have to figure out what that point is. So that's where I bring up this homework problem. That is that m is bigger than n for n bigger than or equal to eight. And so that's true in the even case and in the odd case. So that leaves us with the following seven numbers to check. So we've got n equals one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So checking those one at a time, if n equals two, that's gonna give us m equals negative three, but that doesn't satisfy this size requirement over here. And we'll see that a bunch of these don't satisfy that size requirement. If n equals four, that's gonna make m equal to negative 11. Again, doesn't satisfy the size requirement. If n equals six, that's gonna give us m equals minus 15. Again, doesn't satisfy the size requirement. So next, if n equals one, that tells us that m equals zero, but then we'll see that those two values for m and n plugged into this equation up here very clearly gives us just the zero matrix. But the zero matrix satisfies our goal, so this is a solution. So next, looking at n equals three and n equals five, we'll see that m equals negative six and m equals negative 14. Neither of those satisfy the size requirement. Finally, if we look at n equals seven, that'll give us m equals negative six. And plugging these two numbers in here, we'll see that we get the diagonal matrix 42, 0, 0, 42 which again satisfies this rule right here. And that's a good place to stop.